So annotation, an ancient education technology that we're all familiar with well before the invention of computers. People were annotating on the margins of medieval texts as here. And I know that I as a student was taught from a very early age to write in my books, to take ownership, uh, start you know, uh, using it as a tool for reading comprehension, but also for deeper analysis uh, of text. And thank you, Nate, for starting the recording. <laughs> <laughs> which I forgot to do. Uh, I, I should mention I have two colleagues here, Peg and Nate from Hypothesis, who are helping me out. Um, and we'll be answering questions in the Q&A and also responding in the chat. Uh, this is an interactive Zoom webinar. If you've never been part of one, and you can uh, ask questions and also chat, announce yourself, things like that. And you can raise your hand. I'm not sure what that does. This is really the second time I've ever used it. But um, you can see there's some people in the chat there. Um, but going back, uh, when, when books move online, and I know a lot of us are now assigning texts to be read that are actually housed online, we lose this fundamental literacy practice of, of annotation. And we know from research that students are not main, uh, retaining as much when they read online, they're not engaging as deeply with the content. And so this is a problem. Uh, and annotation can do a couple things. Annotation can both bring, well, that, uh, let me just mention one other thing. We also know that when students are reading text like this delivered online, even in Canvas, they're probably actually looking at screens at multiple are like this, with multiple tabs open. Some of them might be useful resources related to the reading, uh, like the Wikipedia page or YouTube. Some of them uh, might not be, <laughs> uh, like Facebook or Twitter. That's arguable. I know, for example, Ramey uses a lot of Twitter in his class. Um, so students are not reading as well online. We need to, to sort of rethink how we're teaching students to read in a digital environment, and I think annotation plays a big role there not only in sort of returning uh, annotation uh, as a practice to texts like this that are in a digital format, but also to thinking about reading, reading comprehension, reading analysis as a communal, as a social activity uh, that leverages all the wonderful network aspects of uh, the online environment that might be seen as distractions, but also can be seen as empowering uh, students as readers. Um, so that's just a very quick overview about annotation. I think if you're joining this webinar, you probably already get it, uh, although we can talk more about that. And that the whole point of this is to get into the deeper aspects of the pedagogical value of annotation, both uh, digitally, analog-wise, and uh, in different types of digital environments, like the learning management system and the open web. Very quickly, what does the Hypothesis uh, app do? Well, it can be used online to annotate any text, as I said, outside of the LMS. Uh, here's an article from the New York Times that's been annotated. And here's that same article served up as a web page within Canvas, um, where instead of using a browser extension as you would hear, um, it's native to the Canvas environment. Uh, adding the app to your Canvas course makes it native to that environment so students don't need to add anything else. Hypothesis just lives there. You can see the Hypothesis sidebar. Uh, you can configure this on uh, web pages served up through uh, Canvas, public web pages, but also PDFs, which I think probably most folks using uh, the Canvas uh, LMSs are serving their students PDFs for reading, and so this allows you to add a layer of annotation to those PDFs. So this is Canvas. This is the Canvas app. Um, here's a PDF served up. This one is a web page, right? Here's a PDF served up with the uh, annotation sidebar there. And you can also you can serve these up just as readings where annotation is present, or readings where annotation is submitted as an assignment. So you can submit annotation sets on a particular reading. So you can have students collectively and collaboratively read a text like this uh, PDF article, and then individual students would submit their annotations, um, and those would end up in SpeedGrader and allow an instructor to grade if they choose. Of course, it can be pass-fail, um, or just provide comments. I think this is really cool because, you know, as I showed before, that uh, all quiet on the Western Front. You know, when I was doing this, uh, I've heard of students, teachers checking students' annotations in class before. I never did that. I never had that done to me. But usually this was a sort of private thing one did for oneself. Maybe you did it well. Maybe you didn't do it well. I got into grad school for English, so I guess I did it pretty well, this annotation stuff. But you don't really know. I didn't really know how to do it. Teachers never checked it. I never checked my students doing it. I just told them by, by way of Billy Collins to annotate in their, in their margins, and it would be good for them. Basically, like, take your medicine in, and it's going to be healthy. But now, with something like the speed grader functionality, I can go in and give one-to-one -one feedback on this practice of annotation. And that can be according to whatever rubric I define as the important way to, uh, to, to ask students to annotate. And it can vary depending on assignment. Sometimes it might you know, require citations. Sometimes it might just be checking in on the uh, sort of inquisitiveness and engagement of students. 
Um, all right, so that is uh, Hypothesis on Campus. There's a number of resources here, how to install it, um, whether you're an uh, instructor or administrator of a Canvas uh, install, um, a teacher guide for its daily use, and a student-facing guide for how students can, um, uh, can use the app as well. Um, and then there's some general hypothesis resources here as well. So I'm just going to quickly say five ways to annotate in the classroom and then turn it over to our panelists. Um, and these are just very broad strokes. Um, one is the teacher annotates. So you can present a document within Canvas that you've annotated as, and, and guide students through it uh, with your own explanations and definitions, uh, certain kinds of classrooms, that's obviously useful. Um, or you can pose questions that students would annotate, would respond in a threaded conversation below. Um, so you can think about this as, you know, discussion forums, but within a text or really located on, you know, within a text right in its uh, environment where the questions might arise rather than uh, on some other uh, platform. Um, of course, you can also have students comment and have conversation. I think this is uh, the bread and butter of what we do. Uh, it's really a discussion tool. It's about conversation. Um, it's about students reading together and making meaning together. Um, you can have them annotate with multimedia aspects like video and images, so you can really bring text to life through annotation, through digital compositions in really neat ways. Um, and then finally, it can be used for sort of independent but shared inquiry. I have this slide because I presented it in Middlebury last week, so it was a, a you know, Frost reference, but students can annotate and they can annotate on different documents, not all on the same document, but using the group functionality, all their annotations and all the documents they've been annotating and bookmarking can be gathered together in one place in one library for others to, for you to follow their independent research and their annotations, uh, but for them to follow each other as well. Um, but at the same time, where we're going, there are no roads. Uh, so really, this is a completely open tool for you to use however you see fit. Uh, it's very, very flexible, and you can make up your own rubric for how you want students to annotate um, and, and implement that. And lastly, I'll just say that one thing beyond this idea of annotation, which I've grounded this whole discussion in, is that I've heard again and again from teachers, and aside from just close reading, um, part of the power of collaborative annotation and a tool like Hypothesis is really about community building. I've had teachers tell me that they use this. Yes, they're using it for close reading and discussion on text. But the cool thing they see is that after using this tool, students are primed for collaboration in completely different environments, whether it's in small groups in the class, peer review of essays, using a totally different technology or no technology at all. They're just ready to collaborate and they come together as a unit uh, more powerfully. Um, all right, I hope I have not talked too long. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, the panelists. I'm going to, uh, uh, stop screen sharing. Um, <clears throat> and I think uh, I, we didn't talk about an order here. Um, I'm looking at my folks here. Uh, but I'm going to say, why don't we start with uh, Michelle? Is that all right, Michelle? Do you feel like you're OK to start? <laughs> and I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. You can screen share. But again, these are four teachers who have been using the hypothesis in the classroom, uh, some inside of Canvas, all inside of Canvas, but also some use it outside and and they're the real experts and I'm, I'm super thankful that they're able to be here and and share their projects. Great. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Sprouts. I am currently a PhD student at the University of Michigan in the joint program in English and Education. Um, I also have experience teaching eighth grade literature so I'm going to be talking from the middle school perspective and also from the college perspective on how I use annotations. I'm going to switch over to sharing my screen now. There we go. So you should be seeing um, my slide presentation and I will walk you through some of the ways again that I use um, Canvas and Hypothesis for grading and for rubrics. Um, and to start off in terms of pedagogy, I think it's really important to think about your goals for the course. Um, so I asked myself two questions. What are my instructional goals and why are my students reading? And those answers um, really helped me to think about why I'm using the tool because any tool is just a tool until you, until you use it. Um, and so my students might be reading for um, information or they might be reading 
prepare for a literary analysis, or in the case of my first year composition course, my students might be reading to um, borrow some strategies from the model text that we're reading to use in their own writing. Um, so again, I've kind of gone over some of those broad course goals, um, but I also find that annotation of the shared text really helped me to meet some other um, goals as well. So teaching my students how to read well in a discipline, whether that's um, literature or a composition course, um, to see how they're reading before class so I can better plan our in-person work. And this is, I think, one of the really great um, things about the digital and social annotation that we can do in Hypothesis. Um, Jeremy was talking a little bit about um, having his students uh, read and annotate and then not really being able to check them. Um, I was one of those middle school teachers that walked around and checked my students' books to make sure they had some sticky notes or marks in there. Um, but it is really great to be able to see how they're reading and thinking before they get to class so that I can change my um, plans for the class if I need to. Um, and I've also found this semester that I've really been able to encourage my students to share and see the differences in the ways we understand and evaluate texts. Um, I certainly have some students who are really reluctant to speak up in class, but sometimes they're my best annotators. So to be able to see how they're thinking and how that might differ from their peers, um, I think this gives them another way to participate in what's happening in the class. Um, so once I've kind of set those goals for um, what my students are going to be doing when they're reading and annotating, um, I turn to Canvas and try to set up some things beforehand so that um, I can give my students that kind of targeted feedback they need. So what you're looking at right now is an outcome from my current first year composition course where our goal is really to be reading rhetorically. Um, and so I have set up um, an outcome in Canvas and this outcome, um, I've got at the top the title there. I have a description of the goal that my students can also see. And then I've set up um, the, the range of performances that I might expect from my students. The mastery there is the four points. So in my um, department, this is what students are expected to be able to do in terms of reading. And so once I started there, I was able to, to move up a little bit and think about what goes beyond that level of skill and also to kind of shift down and think backwards so that I could give my students some feedback using this outcome in Canvas. What you're looking at here now is um, a rubric that I used last year in my eighth grade literature class. Um, and so I've combined four different outcomes into a single rubric. And I think this is really great. Um, it lets me give them a lot of feedback on the different reading strategies I might be asking them to use in a single assignment. Um, this one is based on the Common Core State Standards um, and the level nine is, is kind of the mastery level. And for this uh, rubric, I looked up at um, ninth and 10th grade uh, Common Core State Standards to think about what would be beyond the grade level expectations. And I was also able to look down at the seventh and sixth grade standards to think about where they might be if they're not yet on grade level in terms of their literary analysis skills. And so once I've set up the outcomes and I've set up the rubric in Canvas, things get um, really easy to, uh, to use and to give my students feedback. Um, once they've submitted their work in Canvas, um, I see that in SpeedGrader and I'm able to use the rubric to give them feedback. Um, I choose for my composition students to give them credit for completing the assignment. And I do that because um, I use it as formative assessment. So I'm not using it for grade, but I wanna give them that little bit of motivation to make sure that they complete the assignment. Um, because I have the outcome set up, I can see patterns in the class. I can see how students are doing over time. Um, and I can also see a big picture of the class on how they're doing in, in the, the strategy as a whole. So I know if I need to spend some more time um, reteaching a particular skill or if, um, they're doing pretty well. And then because um, it's in Canvas, we also have that option to give comments, um, which I think is really awesome. I can give them targeted feedback on how they're doing in their annotations in a way 
that really wasn't possible before Canvas integrated with Hypothesis, um, or especially when our students were making those kinds of annotations just within their personal kind of paper text. Um, so for me, this is the really kind of exciting thing. Um, you know, it's one thing to model for students how to do something like annotate a text and then assign them that same work. But once you can see what they're doing and give them that kind of very quick feedback and use that to plan your kind of next class, next instructional step, I think there's a lot of opportunities for growth in their reading skills and then, you know, how you can facilitate the in-person discussions that follow up. And like Jeremy, I really hate discussion word posts. So this is a really great way, I think, to recenter um, our class uh, reading right within the text rather than in those long discussion board posts that no one really wants to read anyways. Um, I'm going to wrap up so we can hear from other speakers, but if you have any questions for me, you can tweet me at Michelle Sprouse or you can send me an email. Um, and if you're interested in taking a closer look at the slides, there's a short link there for you. And then I'll try Michelle. to get out of my, yeah. Uh, before you go, we, this is Nate, we have a question from Joel. Yeah. He says it's a predictable question, and he's wondering if your rubrics are in Canvas Commons. They are not right now. Sorry. Sorry, Joel, but maybe that will uh, spur her to contribute them. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking that. I think uh, that's Hillel in, uh, in Dallas uh, at Green Hill School. Uh, I, I'm going to work with Michelle. She's going to share those. I'm going to work with her to see if we can get those in the um, uh, in Canvas Commons. I, I need to look into the rubric piece of this all, but Michelle's definitely inspired me to figure out a way to get some resources on, on the hypothesis side about sharing uh, such rubrics or doing some model rubrics that people can adapt. Um, but that just, that, that blew my mind, Michelle. Thank you so much for that. Uh, let's go from Michelle to uh, Sarah, if that's okay. Um, and then we'll just, I'll just announce the, the, the order since I'm doing it uh, now. I will go Alan and then we'll close with Rainy. Thanks, I'm really happy to be here. Um, my name is Sarah Clayton. I'm a digital scholarship specialist. I'm a librarian at the University of Oklahoma. Um, and I was lucky enough to work with one of our history faculty, David Robel, on his course, John Steinbeck's America, where we use hypothesis. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Okay. Okay, I think you can all see my screen now. Um, this is the Canvas site for John Steinbeck's America. And um, one of the main reasons that we chose to use Hypothesis is its tagging functionality. Um, there's a bit of a reason around that. So when John Steinbeck was writing The Grapes of Wrath, he wrote to his editor and he said, um, there's five layers in this book. A reader will find as many as he can, and he won't find any more than he has. Um, so for the past, well, since The Grapes of Wrath was written, scholars have debated these five layers and how many they can find. Um, most notably is Susan Schillinglaw. She wrote a book on reading The Grapes of Wrath where she has her own five layers. Layers. Uh, David has his own layers. But what we really wanted is the students to dive into the text and try to identify as many layers as they could, either the ones scholars that had come up with or ones they saw themselves. So um, we tried this last year before we knew about Hypothesis with a discussion board and um, it didn't go as well as we liked. People have already hinted discussion boards aren't ideal. We were actually trying, we maybe didn't know it yet, but we were trying to do annotation through this discussion board interface. Uh, this is D2L, we, switched since, we have since switched to Canvas. Um, so the interface is a little different, but um, we had them actually write out the text they found in the book and then write comments on it. So yes, annotation. Um, we tried to do the titles being the layers they saw, breaking through biblical, um, NW's Myth of the West, and the students really enjoyed it. Um, I think it was one of our favorite, our most popular class sessions and they asked that, um, or they expressed interest in doing it beforehand, earlier on in the class. Um, and so we heard from our Center for Teaching Excellence, I think Keegan is um, on this call, um, about Hypothesis and how it was a great tool. And we thought, well, the next time we try this course, why not try it with Hypothesis? Um, so we met with John Stewart, who's from our uh, Center for Teaching Excellence, um, um, our Assistant Director for Digital Learning. I was gonna get his title right. Um, and we planned out this course centered around Hypothesis. 
Um, so we had three in-person class sessions on the hypothesis and using that with me there and uh, David wandering around to help with kind of thinking through these issues. And what we asked the students to do is this is the same chapter we just had that discussion board post is to go in, write comments and tag all of the layers they found. Um, the first thing we noticed was we were getting a lot more annotations. Uh, this one has 46. We had 11 people comment on discussion posts. It's about the same time, amount of time in class working on it. Uh, what we also found is it was really great to be able to search for themes, so our layer. So gender is one of the common layers. And so we're able to search through that, see um, where they're finding it, where it's concentrated. Um, if we jump over to click these, we'll see um, this, this is the chapter 26 that we are looking at. We can see all the tags uh, that were chosen. We perhaps could have done a better job at specifying tags. Um, we have gender a couple of ways, but we're seeing what the students are finding and what they're coming up with. Um, we can also see who all has worked on this chapter. They got to pick which chapters they wanted to annotate. Um, and then we can see, we can search for that tag throughout the um, the whole corpus kind of that we loaded in Canvas, we used groups. And we can see um, that there's 17, 14. Again, the, the tagging should have been a bit more consistent, but we can see where those annotations are coming up. We can see which students are interested in those topics, um, and that helped us guide them towards research papers that would be interesting. Um, we also, um, noticed that we only required a couple of texts to be annotated, the Grapes of Wrath and Dubious Battle, but we put all of the annotations up on the um, Canvas site, all of the readings they had to do up on the Canvas site, and they actually went in and annotated on their own outside of class time, uh, which we thought was pretty great, and found themes in other works. So this is once there was a war, and they actually went through and they found all these themes of dignity. Um, yeah, so five, five uh, in this text, five results for dignity. Um, so we thought this was a really great way to kind of identify those layers. Um, and kind of speaking to Jeremy's last point, we, um, we encourage the students to go back to these annotations and search for the themes they were interested. So they were building as a class, this kind of collective resource for all the themes. Um, we went through and annotated most of the grapes are wrath. So they have this document um, where they can find where all the instances of gender came up and it's helped students recognize places um, that they didn't see the, the layer before. Um, with that, that was pretty quick, but um, I'll leave it up to the other presenters and if anyone has any questions, feel free to, feel free to let me know. Wow, Sarah, that is so cool. <laughs> uh, I hadn't heard the whole story about that particular project, and uh, it's really amazing, especially as a former lit guy. I guess I'm still a lit guy. Um, to hear about sort of finding those layers is so cool. I just want to, as we're transitioning, I think we'll go to Alan next. Just want to highlight a couple things that I that I heard from Michelle and Sarah. One is that Michelle talked about how she can leverage the annotations uh, to better prepare for class or to adjust. Uh, for preparation for class, which I think is really neat to sort of think about annotation as a um, you know, class preparation activity that informs actually what goes on in the classroom, in a normal face-to-face -face discussion in the case of uh, brick and mortar classrooms. But Sarah went the other direction, right? The annotations have become an archive that students can mine for uh, more summative assignments, you know, down the line, like a final paper in an English class, for example, which I think is really cool. I, I had that personal experience uh, as well. Um, and I just have to say really quickly as a former grad student, uh, gosh, there's a, there's a, there's clearly an article in here about <laughs> taking Steinbeck's layers and then seeing what the students did and, uh, it just has to be written. So, uh, thanks. And, and Alan, take it away. Um, hello everyone. My name is Alan Reed and I am assistant professor at uh, Coastal Carolina University where I teach courses in English and new media. Um, I'm going to be covering peer review using hypothesis with the Canvas integration. So I'm a, I'm a rogue Canvas user here at the university. Um, I use the free version of Canvas which hypothesis still integrates perfectly well with that. If you um, would like to experiment with it on your own and your university or school does not 
use uh, Canvas as its official LMS. Um, so for this course in particular, it's a graduate writing course in the Master of Arts in Writing, but um, it's still applicable across all levels. I do the same types of activities with my um, undergraduates as well. Uh, but essentially what we do is I ask for students to choose one of their works and um, as a PDF file post that text in our course files section in Canvas and then I create an assignment from that uh, file and the assignment from there is for all of the students enrolled in the course to annotate and essentially workshop that student's paper using hypothesis. So um, here's an example of an assignment um, for someone named Holcomb. So when you click on it, I give them some basic uh, general direction on how to um, annotate and some questions to keep in mind uh, while they're doing that. They can click on the button to open up Kimberly's paper in a new window. This one's already been done. Um, but they would just need to sign in to Hypothesis with accounts that they already have. Um, and, and I should note as well that I ask all of the students who upload their paper, I ask them to um, post five questions that they would like to have resolved um, about their paper. So in this case, Kimberly is posting five specific questions that she would like answered regarding her paper. Um, and then students keep those questions in mind as they're annotating the um, document themselves. And of course, as you can see, you can uh, you can add GIFs and um, images as well, which students often like to do that um, to express their <laughs> express their thoughts. They they love to do that. Um, but along the way, um, you can see all of the different annotations coming through. Um, and so for Kimberly, when all of this is finished, she'll have a fully annotated document from her classmates. And um, in my experience, this is much more effective than doing a separate sort of peer review activity or a separate peer review worksheet or something like that, which is what I used to do. Um, actually having these conversations directly in her text is uh, extremely beneficial. Um, and you can see a lot of these um, will branch off into other conversations and replies to each other if someone's thinking the same thing or if they're building off of each other's comments. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's that's a pretty typical activity that we have uh, for these types of courses. Um, and then on my end, when this is um, closed, when the assignment has ended, I can go into the speed grader and look at each individual student's contributions to that document and then assign a grade. Um, and so then as, we, as we've already heard um, from Michelle, uh, you can assign rubrics and uh, provide feedback and comments through Canvas this way, and it all syncs into the grade book as well. But if I click on um, Emery's uh, annotations here, these are all of his annotations that he made on that document as part of his um, peer review. So I can go through and read this, and then ultimately uh, assign it a score and uh, give him some feedback if I wanted to. And um, that's that, so it's all in one place. Uh, so from, from a grading perspective, the usability is extremely um, streamlined. Uh, everything's in one place. And from the student perspective, everything's in the same place for, for them as well because they get to see all of their annotations on their papers uh, right in front of them instead of, um, I guess, another way that we used to do is just sort of um, bring 10 copies of your paper to class and have everybody write on them. And then now you have 10 copies of your, your own paper with notes. So. Um, this is a much more effective way to do this sort of activity through um, peer review. That's great, Alan. Um, I, I had the same experience where uh, when I taught composition at University of Texas, Austin, we would, you know, kid would walk out with 20, 10 to 20 copies of their paper, not, not always super helpful. But the other piece of that that I think, and, and, and I mentioned this in a different context, that's super cool is that um, you know, it is an important thing to teach students how to peer review. I mean, peer review has a kind of end goal, which is like and make you know, the revision better. But it's also important for students, perhaps even more important for students to learn how to give other people comments, not just for those other people, but for learning and thinking in a meta way about writing. <laughs> um, and the, the speed grader piece, again, may, could be done past fail, it's not necessarily for a mark. But being able to distill that and say, I can see, as you said, this one student's contributions in peer review, 
um, and see their process or see their practice and be able to give them feedback there could be just as valuable as them getting feedback on their own writing. Um, and that's also something I feel like was sort of lost uh, when we did peer review uh, in a more uh, analog way. Um, thanks, Alan. I just want to note one quick technical thing from Alan, then we'll turn it over to Ramey. Um, Alan showed that students would post questions on their papers um, in page notes. So hypothesis allows you to make, you know, inline comments where you select text and make a comment. And then he toggled over to a separate um, tab that shows page notes. These are, these are notes that are not attached to a particular piece of text, but are attached to the page, kind of like the head note in a, in a visual anthology. I was going to demo it again. And so that's just another feature of hypothesis to point out since we didn't do a demo. Um, and uh, Alan did that wonderfully uh, live, but right here you can see um, there's the, uh, just show all annotations and the option. Um, so there's the page note column and then the annotation column. Gosh, that's a lot of feedback for one paper, like 125 annotations. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, <laughs> they like I, th I think that's also something that uh, I've seen with students and teachers using this as, as peer review or just kind of comment on blogs is that the word count, the amount of feedback that people are getting on their own work um, is just a lot, a lot more. Uh, all right, Rami, I'll let you take it away, buddy. Hey folks, so I'm going to see if I can share my screen as well, um, get, this, get this going. And as I do so, I'm going to um, begin by um, kind of starting with what inspired me to jump into and join Hypothesis uh, and begin to use it. Can folks see my slide deck okay? My full screen now? Yeah, great, okay. Um, so I'm going to kind of zoom back a, a little bit and then jump not only into what I'm doing currently with Hypothesis in Canvas, but then also expand a bit beyond the LMS as, as kind of the last person to speak since the folks before me have covered such important information about what's actually happening inside of Canvas. Um, so all my information is here, but let me just jump in to note that what drew me to use Hypothesis and web annotation from a pedagogical perspective initially uh, is that the platform of Hypothesis exemplifies uh, and you know this approach to open web annotation and the open features of this really I think are important for considering more expansive and also more equitable approaches to pedagogy and student learning and that includes things like annotations that are developed according to a standard technical specification um, the fact that hypothesis itself as a tool is open source that uh, student productions of annotations can be publicly licensed via Creative Commons and help to contribute back to a kind of broad peer knowledge commons um, that's very interdisciplinary in some respects, and that this ultimately all supports um, a commitment to open educational practice. And so it was for really these reasons that I, I found myself um, as a learning scientist and as a teacher educator drawn to the Hypothesis platform. Um, and as I've thought about using uh, Hypothesis in an educational context uh, for both online and also hybrid learning over the past year, I've begun to identify what I think are some important conditions that, that the hypothesis open web annotation creates for learning. And these, of course, occur both within the Canvas LMS and, of course, when using hypothesis for open annotation beyond the LMS. And so, as, as many folks have kind of alluded to today, this allows student activity to be situated in authentic contexts, to be in the document that we're reading. And I think that that, uh, in and of itself, uh, is a really distinctive affordance of this technology. Uh, as Jeremy noted, discussion forums uh, kind of become this artificial context that really separates the authenticity of conversation. And this is a tool that really you know, promotes that. Um, as Alan just mentioned a few minutes ago, there's a kind of multimodal expression. He was mentioning the gifts that get, a, get populated into the social reading practices of our students. And I think that that's also a really unique affordance of the tool as well the ability to create connections across contexts, the tagging that has been mentioned, uh, you know, specifically by Sarah, I think is a really neat way to create those kind of connections of connections. And then of course we can ultimately use this to curate resources and conversations. And so I've begun to just try to think in a more meta way about what this tool is doing for learning practices um, beyond again, the confines of any specific LMS. But of course I am bringing this into my work in Canvas. And so I've been teaching now with Hypothesis in various configurations uh, for four semesters now. This is a brief overview of the classes that I teach at the University of Colorado, Denver, where I'm an assistant professor of information and learning technologies. 
Um, so I teach, for example, a games and learning course, which has used annotation in both entirely open and public ways. And then this semester has actually been using it uh, within Canvas and using a private group uh, format. I've been thinking a lot about the various purposes for the use of annotation, whether it's just for the discussion of course texts or also for peer review and what that begins to look like in terms of peer reviewing people's work through um, annotation practices. And as you can also see here, I'm teaching exclusively graduate students, many of whom are educators. And so there's a kind of, again, meta level um, kind of set of conversations happening as my students who themselves are educators are using the hypothesis platform. They're also thinking about how they might apply this to their own practice. Um, so to give a quick sense of what that looks like, here is one of my current students' public blog posts about how he's been using Hypothesis inside of Canvas. And he talks about attacking the readings, both those that are required and chosen, using Hypothesis to take initial notes, and he's using his own private working group. So he's created his own private group outside of even our class private Hypothesis group to take his first pass of notes. It has he notes, it lets him to organize his ideas and read the article without being distracted by the ideas of others. Then he takes his working annotations and he transfers them to our private ILT 5320 group. Um, and then he says it allows them to share their thoughts, to formulate additional ideas, and to use those to reply to, to his, his colleagues. And so to me, this is an uh, kind of an interesting example of kind of scaffolding an individual student's reading practices from the individual private to the class private as a way of formulating uh, rich discussion. And I've talked to a lot of my students uh, after their course um, experiences about how they found the use of, of hypothesis generally. And they, they, they provide kind of representative comments like this about the kind of discourse with professors and others who may join in if it's public um, about the quality of that uh, experience and, you know, as someone said here, I've never been in a graduate course where the discussions were so contextually relevant and on point. Um, and it kind of is a transition now to some of the work that I've been doing specifically in Canvas this semester to some of what uh, you know, I see as connections across various learning environments and, and learning platforms. Um, a lot of the, the students that I work with are reading texts voluntarily on the open web and annotating because they've had experience now using it in other either private or Canvas-based uh, you know, experiences. And they're also integrating their use of Hypothesis uh, very regularly on Twitter and on blogging platforms. And my students have this kind of routine where if they've read a colleague's blog, they'll layer on private or public Hypothesis comments, and then they'll share on Twitter, hey, I've left some comments for you in Hypothesis to extend our learning in those spheres, which is, I think, an interesting, again, transition of Canvas-based practicing and discussion of annotation with course texts to public peer feedback on blogs that's then also promoted on places like Twitter. So when I see those kinds of arrangements emerge, I begin to think about, and I've done a little bit of writing about these kind of emergent, playful kind of coordinations of social media platforms that create meaningful learning experiences for learners. I don't want to talk about this in too much detail now, but I am thinking about the ways that Hypothesis Web Annotation integrates with other social media platforms, including Canvas, but, but beyond as well. Um, and I'll just wrap up very quickly here by talking about uh, and mentioning some of the more open and collaborative annotation activities that I think educators are attracted to because they've had practice as learners using things like the Canvas-based um, Hypothesis uh, integration. And that's leading to projects that, like Jeremy and I have been organizing. We have one now called the Marginal Syllabus, which is basically organizing open uh, collaborative conversations, often with educators, about issues of equity in education. Some of the authors and organizers that we've begun to work with are noted here. We've been taking these basic social reading practices and bringing them into these kind of open annotathon spaces where we can have these situated conversations and curate resources in a public way. Um, and tackling a lot of interesting topics that you would find in the syllabus of a course, but we're now finding as attractive ways of having conversations, again, in more open spaces. So I just wanted to kind of briefly mention that and, and some writing that Jeremy and I have also done about this there. I'll leave it there. Thanks, folks. Uh, happy to talk about other comments and questions as they arise. Wow. Thank you, Remy. Uh, thank you all for uh, sharing these projects. I have to say, uh, 
My mind is blown and I'm absolutely thrilled and it's not because I work for Hypothesis and you guys are using the Hypothesis tools really the teacher in me um, and the digital pedagogue that's sort of seeing just really, really neat and innovative things being done uh, with technology um, to teach. Uh, so it's, it's incredibly exciting to hear. We have um, another 10, 12 minutes to, uh, to continue the conversation. So this is a great time for uh, you guys. I'll maybe open it up to you guys first to ask questions of each other if you have them. Um, and we'll also pay attention to the chat if folks listening in want to ask uh, questions of our panelists. Um, Jeremy, um, I've got a couple of questions queued up that have kind of come along the way. But if the panelists wanted to uh, kick any questions off to each other, we could start there. Sounds good, Nate. I got, I got them on the back channel, but I'll okay. read them before we close. Any thoughts for each other? They only collaborate through annotation. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer those back channel questions really quickly. They really have to do with hypothesis uh, on a broader scale um, uh, and, and in terms of uh, institutional partnerships and things like that. So Canvas is the only uh, LMS that we have an app for uh, currently, although the plan is to perfect this app or to bring it to a certain stage of development and then really try to bring it into other LMSs uh, as well. Uh, so be in touch if you're working with another LMS, though, as, uh, as Alan uh, has said, uh, he's a kind of rogue Canvas user on this, on this campus. I really do think Canvas has some affordances that, that others don't. Now, just because there's no app for things like Moodle um, or Blackboard, it doesn't mean that hypothesis can't be used in coordination with those uh, LMSs. It just means that hypothesis won't be native to it uh, or synced with the with the gradebook, and and those are nice add-ons. But you can do a lot of what you've heard today, both on the open web, but also using other LMSs. So, for example, you can have a PDF open in Blackboard in a new tab, and then using the browser extension, uh, activate Hypothesis and do the same kind of stuff that uh, that uh, Michelle was doing, and not not with the rubric, but uh, with some of the other stuff. So, it's very possible to get a lot of the Hypothesis functionality. Uh, without using the Canvas uh, integration, although I think it, it brings a lot more to it with the gradebook in particular. Um, you can, you know, we do have teachers that are going through and kind of using uh, paper or using another platform, taking notes on students. There is a profile page for students, so I can go and see all of Ramey's annotations in one place or see all of Ramey's annotations on a certain document and, you know, take notes and then send them an email with a grade or something like that. So it's possible, it's just not quite as, uh, efficient as with the Canvas app. Now, the second piece um, is a second question that came up, uh, and, and also just be in touch, you know, Jeremy, uh, Dean, at Hypothesis about your particular situation, and I'm happy to help um, uh, with a dot before the IS. Uh, the other question that came up uh, was about accessibility, and this is something we've been talking about uh, a lot internally at Hypothesis. Um, it's something we're very dedicated to on a number of levels, and we're drafting currently a sort of state of the union on our accessibility. Um, and we have a projection of the stages we want to go through to become more fully accessible. Um, so accessibility is something we're, we're very aware of, very dedicated to, and literally in process both with drafting something public that will uh, talk about our philosophy and talk about our plan, um, but also implementing some developmental changes uh, some de development that will make hypothesis more accessible. Uh, it is true, though, that currently hypothesis is not hypothesis annotations are not screen readable, um, and you cannot create annotations uh, using a screen reader uh, with hypothesis. So accommodations do need to be made for students with, that, with uh, accessibility issues um, if their uh, classes are using um, uh, hypothesis. Um, the first thing we're going to do is make sure that those, I think the first thing we're going to do is make sure that those annotations are screen readable. Um, and then the second thing would be to make it possible for uh, somebody using a screen reader to create annotations. Um, again, Jeremy Dean at Hypothesis, if you want to talk more about that. Um, but the plan is to have a lot more done by uh, fall 2017 so that schools can feel a lot more comfortable about um, getting started uh, using Hypothesis on a, more, on a broader level. 
Have I uh, any any other questions coming up in Q and A, Nate or uh, panelists for each other? There's Nate's been doing a great job of answering questions. Thanks for that. Peg's been doing a great job of uh, of chatting up a storm and providing a bunch of links. Yeah, I mean, Jeremy, the you know the the only two big questions that came up were around other LMSs and accessibility. And I guess, you know, one of the background questions about accessibility, which is always a moving target, right? And we've talked a lot about, um, you know, the complexity of creating annotations uh, when, when people have different, um, you know, challenges. Um, what, you know, thinking more about accommodations, too. If, mm, I don't yeah. know if our panelists have situations where they've dealt with someone who has a specific accessibility issue and have maybe accommodated their use of hypothesis or something like hypothesis in some creative way when the tool itself actually can't provide full accessibility? That's a great question. I see it's coming from, uh, sort of inspired largely by Cindy Jennings um, and I'd love to both uh, have another session. We certainly have five minutes or so to talk about it now if there's ideas, um, but I'd love Cindy to add another session where we focus on that. Um, and to gather some resources at the Hypothesis uh, uh, Education Portal, uh, which is just Hypothesis slash Education, that talk about uh, accommodations that could be made. I think it's a really great idea. And I know there are folks that are, that are, that are dealing with this. I know particularly at SF State, uh, my, my friend uh, Larry Hanley uh, has been thinking a lot about this and I know has students uh, that, that require accessible, uh, you know, accommodations and I think must have come up with some solutions there. Um, and I know that that student actually and uh, uh, that professor are going to be at our annual conference in just a couple of weeks. So I'll, I'll make sure to, to see if they have any resources to share and, and maybe we can have a session where we really focus in on that. I think it's a great idea, Cindy. So don't, please don't apologize for being a broken record. It's, it's absolutely an important, it's a hugely important thing. Um, so there's really should be no apologies for, for bringing it up. Um, one thing I'll just say about it, and then I'll see if any panelists have anything to say about it as well, is that one of the neat and interesting things about hypothesis, it depends on how you're using it. But, um, you know, it's not um, a video game with some kind of virtual reality immersion thing going on. Right? This is, as I showed, it's a technique that's been around since the invention of the book, if not before, commenting on, on pieces of text. Um, so I imagine there, there are ways, whether it's going back to the analog, um, which may not be accessible as well, uh, or finding other digital tools to leverage. So for example, one thing that can be done is you can extract all annotations and export all annotations from hypothesis using the prototype tool that we have. Um, and maybe then you could get them in a place where, again, it's not going to be quite as contextualized on the tech, and this is just sort of short-term workaround. Um, you could export them into some format that might be screen readable. Um, but I'd like to think more concretely, Cindy, about types of accommodations. Any of you panelists had to deal with accommodation situations and, or have ideas on that uh, tip? All right, well, uh, Cindy, I promised to get back to you about this. Uh, I'll get with Larry and we'll get some resources in the short term. The very first step will be getting some resources on the, on the portal about this um, and having some alternative uh, things that, that folks can do um, to, to basically do similar types of activities using other tools or, or tools in combination or, or whatever. Um, one and one uh, last plug, you might see that um, that Peg put a link to the I Annotate conference that's coming up in a couple of weeks here in May. Uh, so if any of you can manage to get to San Francisco by May, I'd uh, love to have other educators there who have a specific segment in the program dedicated to education topics. There's also other interesting things going on um, in journalism and publishing, scholarly okay. communication there. A lot of really interesting people. It's a pretty cool, intimate gathering of only between 100 and 150 folks. So it's not one of these big, giant conferences where everybody gets lost. A lot of time for uncomfortable. And yeah, let me just use that Nate, to to close out by saying some uh, something about that aspect of hypothesis. I should have said at the start. Um, this is not an education technology company, despite this, that, despite the fact that we're talking about the Canvas LMS. You know, sort of the the king of education technology, I'd say, in some ways, at least in terms of teaching and learning. Um, this is not uh, an education technology. I am the education guy. We have a lot of education users. There's an obvious education use case 
for annotation that goes back well before the invention of computers, as I pointed out. But people are using this uh, same software, same technology, a hypothesis tool. Uh, journalists are using it. Readers of online journalism are using it. Scientists are using it, sometimes in programmatic ways to automatically generate annotations, tons of annotations across, um, across uh, you know, many, many articles and things like that. Archivists, librarians are leveraging the same tool. Um, and so uh, it's bigger than just the classroom. And, uh, and I think one of the neat things, and Ramey alluded to this, students might find it as a useful tool beyond your class. We've had students that bug the next professor to use the tool because they miss the discussions they're having, but also because they're like, this is how I take my notes now. I, I want to take notes this way so I keep all my notes together. Um, but then even beyond, and they have it all in one place, right? They have this collection of their notes um, uh, that they can leverage for papers in, in a class, but also beyond classes, for theses if we go to grad school. I mean, I imagine that all the books I have that are in boxes right now because I'm moving and all the annotations they're in on the paper copies really hard to get back into those right i have to find the book open the book find the page i mean that tactile thing still works but to have it all searchable in a database of my notes and tagged as sarah was pointing out uh, or maybe sub tag like be able to find all my education technology annotations sub tagged um you know accessibility uh then i'd have this a little collection of, of ideas there uh Cindy, maybe that's another thing they could do is start a little group and, and annotate about accessibility um, and then just beyond the classroom, right? We had a project that Ramey was tangentially involved with um, that was really cool uh, called Letters to the Next President with uh, KQED and with the National Writing Project where students were using annotation to comment on um, public documents relating to the, to the, to the election we just had, um, statements made by, by, the, by the politicians, speeches that were made, legislation that was proposed, um, policy statements, things like that. They were commenting on that as a form of engaging civically with, um, you know, online discourse. So it goes beyond, uh, well beyond the classroom. And that's one of the neat things about Hypothesis, that it could start with Canvas, uh, start with Hypothesis within Canvas, but really become something that's part of a, an individual's everyday life, intellectual life, uh, engaged political life um, online. Uh, with that, I think I will close. This session is uh, recorded and I will be distributing the recording. Um, please feel free to reach out to me, Jeremy Dean at Hypothesis or Dr. Underscore Jeremy J. Dean on Twitter. Happy to help you one-on-one -on -one get set up, talk more about the details of what it would mean to get started at your school, with your class, uh, with your institution. But above all, uh, really, I've got such a cool job that I get to hear what teachers are doing in such amazing ways. Um, so I really want to thank uh, Ramey and Sarah, Michelle and Alan for sharing their projects, for not just sharing their projects, but for giving uh, our tool a chance and giving this technology a chance and trying to do something innovative. It's not an easy thing to do to innovate in the classroom. Um, and it's just a privilege to be able to hear about the results because they really are awesome. And all your institutions should give you tenor, give you a hire, whatever it is you're looking for, um, because you're doing great work. Thanks everybody.